Well, good evening and uh, welcome to Revelation tonight, uh, chapter 8. And uh, this evening we're going to continue in the section on the seven seals. And thus far, we have in chapter 6 seen six of the seven seals. Tonight, in chapter 8, we will see the seventh seal, and the seventh seal leads to seven trumpets, right? And so the seals were, as we have seen, a series of judgments, and the seventh seal leads to seven trumpets, which just leads to more judgment of God. And then even past that, then we'll get into the bowls and even more judgment. So, uh, warning now, last week you might have felt a little better about things. Two weeks ago you left here troubled, some of you did at least. Um, tonight's not an overly comforting um, study. Um, but I think if we understand it and understand our place in all of this, it certainly uh, can be comforting to you. So anyhow, the seven seals of Revelation, uh, as I have shared with you repeatedly, seals two and following of those seven seals give us a series of pictures, a series of frames, if you will, of what happens between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus in that final judgment. And in these different uh, judgments that we've seen throughout the seven seals, we see physical and economic persecution, we see death, we see destruction. Uh, in a word, we see judgment. Um, God's wrath being poured out on the world. And so, as a very quick review of the first six seals, the first one um, that we looked at two weeks ago is perhaps the most I don't know if the right word is controversial, but I'll say controversial of the six seals as far as interpretation, um, because I believe that that first seal open was the rider on the white horse holding a bow and wearing a crown as a conqueror bent on conquest is representative of Jesus and the gospel beginning and being proclaimed in the world. And there are some who believe that that first seal would represent who? What's that? The Antichrist. And you can't get much more um, polar opposite <laughs> from Jesus than the Antichrist, right? The word anti, you know, so Christ and Antichrist. Um, so depending on what you might be reading, what you might be studying, you'll possibly read that this first seal represented the Antichrist, um, but I tend to lean towards Jesus. The second seal open was um, a rider on a fiery red horse with a large sword and the power to take peace from the earth and make men slay each other, representative of bloodshed in war. The third seal was a rider on a black horse with a pair of scales in his hand, representing famine and drought as judgment. The fourth seal was a rider named Death on a pale horse with Hades following close behind. And we saw the total, um, not total, but a very large death plague. How many people do you remember? What? What's that? I'm sorry. A fourth? Was it one fourth or was it 20%? I don't honestly remember. It's either 20 or 25%. Was it 25%? Okay, 20, you're right, 25% of the earth, um, of the inhabitants of the earth um, died. And then the fifth seal um, was the souls of the martyrs under the altar of God. And then the sixth seal was that final seal of judgment. Something big is about to happen. And that is when we see the earthquake, the sun turning black and the moon turning red, the stars falling from the sky, and the sky receding like a scroll. Christ pending, coming judgment of the world. Something big is about to happen, and uh, we will see a continuation of that tonight in the seventh seal. But in between that sixth seal and the seventh seal, 
we had an entire chapter. Chapter 7 was an interlude, if you will, between the first six seals and the seventh seal. So last week was kind of like a step back from this, and we got a glimpse last week of two groups of people. Um, the first group of people um, were, were sealed, and a different use of the word sealed. How were these folks sealed? Last week. How were they sealed? No one? What's that? The ones on earth, how were they sealed? Where? That's right. Their foreheads, right? The name of, of the Lord on their foreheads. And what's the purpose of that seal? It was to, it was to protect them um, from the coming judgment. Now, there were two groups of people in chapter 7. Uh, the first group it was 144,000 people, whether that's a literal number or whether that is just a symbolic number. Um, and these folks were where? When we read Revelation chapter 7, where were these 144,000? This number, this group of people. But, but, but where were they in the realm of physicality? They were on the earth, okay? They were, they were people on the earth. 144,000 on the earth. Again, it could be a symbolic number. Um, it could be 144,000 actual members of Jewish tribes. Um, how many um, Jewish tribes were there? 12, um, 12 times 12 times 10 is 144,000. It could be symbolic of all Jews who came to accept Christ, perhaps during. By the way, we're during, this is during a tribulation period, okay? All of these judgments that are being poured out is during this period of intense persecution uh, immediately prior to um, that final judgment. So it could be representative of them. Or it could be symbolic of all faithful believers. This one might be a little bit more of a stretch, but a lot of folks believe this, um, um, who, who were on the earth at that time. The 144,000. The second group of people is called what? The great multitude. And how many people were in this group? Well, first of all, where was this group found? In heaven. These, this group is in heaven. And how many were in this group? Too many to count, all right? Um, yes, we see that, whoop, that's out of place there. Too many to count. And um, we're told that they were from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. Heaven will be a very um, multi-ethnic place, a very inclusive place with people from every background. And if the 144,000 on earth represented the Jewish people, then this great multitude sounds like it's a bunch of who? A bunch of Gentile people, right? Of every different nation, tribe, people, and language. And so we saw that. Um, and in verse 14, we saw that they had come out of tribulation. So um, a lot of these folks, if not all of them, were folks who had been uh, martyred um, for their faith. And we talked just a little bit about this idea of great tribulation. And, um, you know, when it comes to tribulation, God's people have always um, experienced tribulation. And it does appear that in the end times, which we are living in the end times, the nearer and nearer that we get to the end, and by that I mean is when God finally says, it is enough, game over, okay, that there is going to be increased um, persecution, there's going to be increased um, judgments on the earth and on the peoples of the earth. And so we can expect that to increase as the end comes near. Uh, again, I'm speaking to you and teaching you from a post-tribulational viewpoint, meaning um, that the second coming of Christ will happen after the tribulation period, 
and if you are someone who subscribed to a pre-tribulational um, theology, uh, you would believe that before any of this happens, uh, Christ will come and take all the Christians away. And so we won't have to endure that. Um, so God bless you. <laughs> Isn't that such a sweet, innocent little sneeze that she does? I've always thought that. <laughs> so dainty, right? So dainty. <clears throat> okay, chapter 8 um, gets into the seventh seal and the seven trumpets. Um, if we had time, more time, which we don't, and, uh, and if I had more energy, which I don't, um, tonight we would do chapters 8 and 9, because in chapter 8 we see the first four of 8 and 9 kind of go together really well, but I'm just going to make you wait for chapter 9 next week. But um, chapters 8 and 9 go together on these uh, seven trumpets, and tonight we'll see just the first four. But um, as the seventh seal is opened, um, it, it leads to seven trumpets. So kind of like the vision within the vision, or the scene within the scene here, is as this seal is open, it then opens another door to seven more judgments. And these are the trumpet judgments. We've had the seal judgments. We're now entering into the world of the trumpet judgments. And then there'll be more judgments even after that. Um, so tonight, I'm going to go against my own policy a little bit. And we're going to go ahead and, and split this passage up into two parts. And the first part is just the first five verses. So let's take a look at these five verses. Revelation 7. I'm sorry, Revelation 8, 1 through 5. When he opened, who's he? Who's he? Jesus, right? He's the one that has the... Um, Authority, good word, to, to open these seals. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. That was four seconds of silence, and you guys got uncomfortable, didn't you? Half an hour of silence in heaven. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And other angels who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So, any trumpet players in the room? Did no, sir. Did you? Oh, forty-seven years old. I just learned something about my mom. You, <laughs> well, you should be. <laughs> I take her more to be like a clarinet player. I didn't. Ah, oh, all right. So my mom's a trumpet player. Melissa, did you play trumpet? No? Anybody else? Any trumpet players? Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, trumpets here in a minute and, and their purpose. But before we do that, um, the first thing here is we see uh, silence in heaven for about half an hour. Um, what's that? <laughs> he says there will be no women in heaven. No. Well, um, I guess the question here for us to consider um, is, is why? Um, let's first of all ask this question. We've seen a lot of scenes in heaven these last few chapters, haven't we? How does this scene compare to prior scenes in heaven that we've seen in Yes, yeah, this, this is different, isn't it? Um, what have we seen prior? We've seen the, the, the creatures and the elders and the angels essentially in a symphony of praise and of worship, right, to, to the Lamb. 
and, and, to the, and to the Father. And so heaven hasn't been a, a silent place. And, um, but for this about half an hour, it is. Now let me ask you, uh, why do you think it is that there is this silence in heaven for this period of time at this point in Revelation? Heather? Heather? A dramatic pause between the next series of plagues. The calm before the storm. Okay. We're, Mary? else want to um what's happened already let's let's take chapter seven out for now just in our mind and act like you know we go straight from chapter six to chapter eight what's happened we've had six seals opened right and and now the, the seventh and final seal on this very important document it appears is being opened and so um, we're on the verge of the judgment of God being displayed in full force and, and so in a sense perhaps um, it is showing the magnitude of, of, of what's of what's coming right um, as someone said Kind of maybe the calm uh, before the storm. Um, in the Bible, there are several places where, and we're not going to read them right now, but they're on the screen there. Habakkuk 2.10, uh, Zephaniah 1.7, Zechariah 2.13, um, where it sh calls for a, a similar silence right before a demonstration of great judgment and an outpouring of God's wrath upon people. And so there is biblical um, reference history um, for, for this type of thing. That before this, this, and it's not even the final show yet, but it appears to be the final scene in the seven seals at least, that there's, there's silence. The magnitude of what God is doing and is about to do. So let me ask you this. Um, we also see here that there is um, this other angel. We have the seven angels, and then we have another angel, verse 3, with a golden censer, and he stands at the altar. What is a censer? What's a censer? Someone who takes away your free speech? We have, we have a few recovering Catholics in our congregation, so um, you folks are, are probably familiar with censors, right? There's, there's the, I think, is that our current pope? I think it is. I think it's Pope Francis there. But that's a censor, okay? So you all got a picture of, of uh, I've been to Catholic churches. I've been to, you think they use a lot of incense. Um, we went to a wedding. Was it a Greek Orthodox wedding, I believe? And... Uh, the, the incense, you know, that they use. And so that, the incense coming out of, of, of there. Um, and so what is incense, and, and, and the censer here, at least in the beginning part of this, being representative of? What's, what's, what's the purpose? What's, what's, what's incense in any, I, I'm assuming even in, in, in the Catholic Church today and other churches who use it, what's it, what's it symbolize? What people? What's that? I don't think so. I mean, I might be wrong. I don't. Not from What's that? Purifying the air. What's that? Holy Spirit. 
I think it's symbolic, uh, biblically, and I'm not sure how the Catholic Church looks at it, but biblically, in the Old Testament, in here, of, of the prayers of God's people being offered up, offered up to God. The prayers being offered up to God as incense. Um, that's, that's how I think it is biblically, and whether that's what it represents in, in churches that use it today or not, I, I don't know. And there's probably several different um, reasons, but that's the primary one. Um, and so why do you think uh, there are prayers being offered here? First of all, who's offering the prayers? Who? God's the saints, right, which is God's people in verse 3. And why do you suppose they're offering these prayers? Because of what they've been going through? Okay, and they're looking for Jesus. And also, what's, I think also of what's, what's coming, perhaps. Yeah, they're definitely going to need need more prayers. Yeah, because where were these saints at? Yeah, this is the by far the best part of tonight's chapter, all right? We can just quit after chapter, after verse 5 if you want, okay? Uh, it, yeah, it is. It's encouraging, right? And, and, I, and I think, and maybe I'm misreading it, but I think these saints are in heaven. Aren't they? We're in heaven at the altar, and, and um, I, I think, I mean, I guess you can read it either way, but I see it as saints that are in heaven. Karen? The martyrs under the altar? Yep, or the, the great multitude even. Um, you know, the great multitude was also in heaven. So, um, you know, people in heaven... Um, offering these prayers. Um, anyhow, and then something happens, though. The censer uh, goes from this wonderful thing being used to offer incense and prayers, the altar of God. Then what happens? What's, a, what's about to happen here after that? It turns into a weapon of destruction, it appears, right? Um, the censer is filled with what? From the fire from the altar and hurled onto the earth. And we hear peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So do we get a picture here that something's about to happen? The silence is over, huh? Beginning of the end. I think you're going to. Thank you. Hurled is a strong word. Yeah. It wasn't tossed. It's hurled. Well, David Jeremiah is a pre-tribulationalist, and I am not, so I don't. I feel like you know the, the Christians are are still here in this place in human history that they are still here. So I don't feel like um, you know I don't feel like we would escape this. However, what did we see in chapter seven that was encouraging? What did we see in chapter seven that was encouraging, as in regards to the folks on earth? They were sealed, right? And so, you know, again, I kind of likened that last week to the um, Passover and, and the blood on the doorpost of your home that they, you know, the angel of death would pass over that home. And, and so the sealing of uh, the, the elect in the 144,000 at least, that they were protected from, from this judgment that we're now getting ready to, to unveil. 
but it appears that we are at that point of final judgment. Okay, so we're going to look, and again, I mean, there, as we get into these, these different trumpets, it, it's, it's really hard to definitively say what everything represents. There's so much symbolism, but we need to get to the larger picture of what's happening here, and that is a picture of great judgment. We see seven angels with seven trumpets. Uh, what is the purpose of a trumpet in the Bible a lot, oftentimes? Yes, a trumpet would announce important events, signal um, an event in war, um, and we see these trumpets announcing a series of judgments. Um, and we've seen the seal judgments. We now are seeing the trumpet judgments is what they're called. And then we'll see later the bowl judgments. Um, and so that's where we're at. Let's go ahead and look at the second half of this chapter, verses 6 through 13. It says, Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded, sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. Does that sound familiar to anybody? How is it? Wormwood is, um, in, in, in biology, I believe, or would it be botany, a name of a poisonous plant. Okay, I lost my place here. <coughs> the star is wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. And as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. I'm going to leave you hanging there um, tonight, okay? So let's just take a cursory look at at these trumpets, these first four trumpets. Um, <coughs> oh, geez. My, I told you I had a busy day. My slides are all messed up. Okay, the first uh, angel trumpet was what? Hail and fire mixed with blood. Let's try to picture some of this stuff, all right? Um, who remembers uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament? You remember the story? Okay. Destruction, judgment of God upon the sinlessness, the sin of man. And, and how was that city destroyed? It rained down what? Sulfur. sulfur. Yeah, fire, right? Fire, sulfur, yep. Um, also, if you're familiar with the uh, plagues, um, on Egypt in Exodus, um, the seventh plague, and I'm going to go ahead and read that one. I'm not going to read out of Genesis, Sodom and Gomorrah, but I'll read about this plague in um, Exodus chapter 9, 23 and 25. And what were these plagues all about? What was the purpose of them? So they could to free the, the Israelites out of Egypt 
and, and to bring judgment on who? On Pharaoh and the Egyptian people. Um, but in uh, Exodus chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 23 says, Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky. The Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Um, and, and it did great, great uh, devastation. And so um, <clears throat> we see this as a judgment of God being launched um, in the Bible um, time and time again. Fire is a symbol of God's consuming wrath. However, what do we see about the destruction? What, what's something kind of interesting about the destruction that we see here? A third. Okay, we saw in the, um, I forget which seal it was, the fourth or fifth seal, um, the rider on the pale horse, we saw um, the, the rider named Death was at 25%, right? And here we see a, 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 th a people dying. Here we see that a third of the earth is burned up. Um, a third of the trees were burned up. And all the grass, it says, was, was burned up. So this is a partial judgment. What don't we see happen here in this, with this trumpet? What don't we see? What don't you see yet? Uh, someone said it. Death of people, right? We don't see, we don't see that yet, do we? No, we don't see that yet. But there's plenty more to come. The second angel with the trumpet, the second trumpet uh, in verses 8 and 9 is something like, like, okay, so again, taking this, this, this means we, we take this more figurative here than we do literal, okay? Something like a blazing mountain being thrown into the sea, turning one-third of the sea into blood. Anybody have any Old Testament thoughts come here? The first plague, Exodus chapter 7, verses 20 and 21. Moses raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. Um, so that's what, you know, that reminds me of, of that. Um, in the Bible, also, Mountains often symbolize nations. And uh, we, we see that many times in Jeremiah, in Isaiah, in Daniel. Um, and you'll find um, folks who, who believe that this would be a final great judgment upon the enemies of God represented by the nation of Babylon. Um, so whether this is specifically in regard to any specific nation or not, I would say probably not. But in the Bible, mountains often symbolize nations. So the first um, trumpet was against, um, what brought destruction on, on the earth physically. Uh, this one symbolizes perhaps nations. Again, it's partial destruction. We see a third of the sea creatures died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So then we go on to the third trumpet, in verses 10 and 11, the third angel with a trumpet. And this one was a blazing star named Wormwood, which means bitter, falling like a torch from the sky. And as I said, um, I think it says in biology, it, it, in botany, uh, Wormwood is troubling, poisonous plant. What could this possibly represent, do you suppose? What could this possibly represent? 
Does anybody, um, can anybody think of a star that fell? Another star that fell from heaven. Not, not physically, I guess. Yes. Lucifer was called what? Morning star. Yeah, morning star. Um, we read in Isaiah uh, 14, verse 12. Let me turn there really quickly. <clears throat> I think that's the right chapter. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Um, and so we have that reference um, to, to the devil, if you will. And then also in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, I believe Jesus said this. No, verse 18, I'm sorry. Jesus replies, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And so we had that reference. So this, this is what I, you know, to me, if you read this, not that this here represents the devil, but it reminds me of how um, Satan uh, fell from heaven. And, and in, in a similar way, we see this, this judgment here. Um, of, of this blazing star named Wormwood. And we see a third of the rivers and a third of the springs of water. So this is fresh water, whereas the previous one was um, salt water. Um, this is um, fresh water, uh, turning a third of the water bitter and killing many people. Okay? So there we get, here we're seeing some death. Killing many people. The uh, poisonous, this wasn't just bitter water, right? It was, it was, it was poisonous water. It was, it was bitter water that was poisonous with this third trumpet. And then we see something else happen as the fourth trumpet is blown. And the scene that we see with the fourth trumpet in verse 12 is at the sound of the trumpet, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck. And what happened? We have, we have a power outage, don't we? I think a third of Barnesville lost power a couple weeks ago um, with our storm, our ice storm. And here we see that it turned dark a third of the day, because the sun was out, and a third of the night. Um, and so darkness comes um, with this trumpet call. But again, what do we see about this judgment? Is it complete? It is, well, it is partial, right? What, I mean, why do you think that is? What do you think the, at this point in, our, in the story, what do you think the uh, reasoning is that we keep seeing a third, a third, a third, a third? Anybody? Go ahead. You can read your study notes in your Bible if you have them. <coughs> What's that? It is or it is not? Well, I mean, has, is God to the point yet where it's total destruction? No, right? So it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a stern warning. I was at the basketball game last night, and we sat right above the um, Carrollton bench, Bar Shamrocks and Carrollton. And I was with Troy and Amy, and we were sitting right above their bench, and I was really uh, amused by their coach all throughout the game. And late in the game, he took his, one of his star players out. He had, had a foul called on him, and he, he called him out. And when um, the, the guy came off the court, the coach put out his hand to, you know, like to, like, like you know, slap his hand, you know. And, and, the, and the kid didn't do it back. And he sat down on the bench, and the coach turned around. Don't you disrespect me? He says, you're done. He says, you're not going back in this game. You're not going to disrespect me like that. And then and the kid put his head down and said something. The coach turned back around. Keep on talking. Keep on talking. You're done. And then like five seconds later, Barnesville calls a timeout. And, um, and so the, the, the whole team came over to the sideline. And the coach looked at that kid. He's like, are you going to respect me? And the kid just kind of looked at him and said, yeah. He's like, get back in the game. <laughs> you know, so, you know, like 10 seconds earlier, he was like, 
saying, you're done. You're not going back in, you know. So it was like, it's kind of partial. You know, he's holding a little bit back here, right? Um, is it perhaps a picture of the mercy of God? Isn't it still God's desire that people get saved? Will people get saved during the tribulation period? I think so. We'll see. We'll probably skip ahead and read this couple of verses tonight because it's, it, 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 it's important. But we will see uh, that not everyone, and obviously, you'd think that when people see this type of thing, that they would change. But most of them don't, right? Did Pharaoh? No, you know. So, but God's desire is that people would, and that's kind of the purpose, right? Isn't it the purpose of discipline it is to bring about change and repentance? And so to me, I think in the midst of all of this, we, we kind of get a picture of the, um, of the mercy of God and the desire of God as well, that he is patient with us and with the world as he can be. Um, uh, we'll just skip over that right now. Um, and then look at the message of the eagle in verse 13. In verse 13, this eagle, what was the message of the eagle? What, what, what's an eagle represent in, in the Bible? Does it really? In verse 13? Verse 13? She said in verse 13, it says angel. Really? Raise your hand if verse 13 says, I heard an eagle in your Bible. Most. Raise it if it says angel. A few. Huh. Um, but what is, what does the message of the, of the angel eagle tell us? <laughs> yeah, it's an angel that looks like an eagle or an eagle that looks like an eagle. It's an angelic eagle is what it is. But the important thing is, what does his message, his or her message, tell us? Yeah. Um, perhaps you've heard it said, the best is yet to come. Um, but here we see the worst is yet to come, right? And so it should speak to us about the importance of, um, of getting right with God. I have a few discussion questions. Um, what do these four trumpets that we looked at tonight um, of the seventh seal teach us about God's judgment? One. Number two, what do they teach us about God's mercy? Um, actually, I got these on here. Number three, uh, jump ahead to Revelation 9, 20 and 21. This is after we see the, the next three trumpets. And it says in verses 20 and 21, the rest of mankind that were not killed, oh gee, so that means we're going to, we got some death to read about next week, don't we? But the rest of mankind that were not killed of these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons, the idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that could not see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. That's kind of a sad commentary, right? We've seen some bad stuff. We're going to see a lot more bad stuff next chapter. And yet at the end of that chapter, we see a, what the situation is. So what do those verses suggest to us about the possible purpose of the trumpet judgments and also the results of them? And the number four, how can we prepare, this is an easy question, for uh, this type of, of judgment of God? And even if we are in Christ, even if we are protected, um, how, uh, what's the message for us to take from this uh, when it comes to um, these judgments and people in, in the world? So we only got a couple of minutes, two or three minutes. Does anybody want to offer up a, a, an answer or a thought on any of these discussion questions that I've just posed?
not the people in that verse, no. But I think a lot of people will be saved through tribulation. And I think regardless of whether you're pre-tribulational or post-tribulational or whatever, whatever you might feel about that, um, that I think most people believe that either way, I mean, even people who are pre-tribulational and believe that in, in this in the secret rapture and, and all the Christians go to, to heaven, okay, um, and, and, then, and then this tribulation period starts, even those people, especially those people believe that during that horrible, horrible period of time, people will become Christians. Right? Absolutely. The people will become Christians during that period. I mean, it'll be, it, I'll tell you this much, it'd be a lot easier to become a Christian now than then, but that door is still open, you know, it's always open until it's not open. And so even during that tribulation period, people could become saved. And, and, and vice versa, if you are a post-tribulational person who doesn't believe that Jesus will come until after tribulation, then still obviously believe that uh, in those last days, those very last days, that people will, some people, obviously, obviously not all, but some people will repent and turn to God. Um, and that's good. That's, yeah. Any, anybody else want to offer up a thought on any of these discussion questions? Yes. I think so. Until the pot boils over. Yep. Right. Yep. So. Uh huh. Kind of a kind of a losing battle, right? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, fresh and not not just salt water, but fresh water. Yeah. Yeah. Get all the fishing in now while you can, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, perfect timing, Challen. Okay, um, let's uh, close in prayer. And then next week we'll look at uh, chapter 9, which is the next three uh, uh, trumpets. And um, go from there. Rick? Um, I, that, that was the, the earthquake and the, yeah, all the natural disasters. Yeah. I think that was a momentary, uh, yeah, I don't think it meant total permanent darkness on the earth. I think that just, I think that was just like a moment, in that moment with the earthquake and the darkness and all the things that happened in that moment, but I don't think it was like a permanent darkness over, yeah, I see your point, so. We're getting, we're getting pictures of some of the same things from different. Well, 
That's a good way of looking at it. Actually, chapter 8 starts, it, we talked at the beginning of, of the study about parallelism and the different sections, if you recall. And, and chapter 8 begins another section because if you back at the end of um, chapter 6, I mean, that was like, that, that sixth seal was kind of like God's judgment is here, you know. And so really, the, the trumpets in many ways parallel the seals, if that makes any sense. So I think that's a good point. It's not, as I said at the very beginning of the study, it's not everything in Revelation isn't necessarily to be taken in chronological order, that this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Um, we're looking at it, you know, through our lens of time and, and space, but that's not necessarily, it's not a linear production. It's much, it's much different than that. So it's parallel. Okay. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time in your word tonight. We thank you for uh, giving us um, some insight and hopefully some understanding. And hopefully, Father, we will all get the, uh, the, the message and we know that judgment is coming and that you will have the final say. Help us to find safety and security in you. Help us to repent of our sins, God, and um, help us to share this message with others. The day of reckoning is coming. And uh, I pray that you would help us, Father, to um, be right with you and to share that message with others. Thank you for being a just God. And thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to um, bridge that gap for us. And though our sins are as scarlet, um, they can be uh, white as wool because of the blood of the Lamb. And we thank you for that. Help us to find comfort um, and strength in that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I do have handouts if anybody's interested.